Okay, um, so before we dive specifically into uh, these best practices for um, cross-functional collaboration that we're going to share, we did want to um, provide a little bit of context around um, the environment in which uh, software is often delivered at um, especially larger organizations. So if we go to the next slide, um, you can see that while a lot of people probably think that um, software is you know, mostly about typing in the code and maybe doing some testing, a lot of you on the webinar probably know uh, that the full end-to-end -end life cycle of software development and delivery um, spans many more stakeholders than just those two groups. Uh, so this diagram is just illustrating that from end-to-end, -end, you've got not only development and testing, um, but also things like business outcomes, sales, marketing, customer feedback, um, and UX and design considerations uh, to consider. So basically, you've got all of these disparate groups that really have um, a unique perspective on things and unique contributions uh, to make that need to be integrated into the entire life cycle to really make sure that you're building impactful products. Um, so that's sort of one, one, um, one aspect of this, but another aspect that sort of complicates things a little bit more is that oftentimes people uh, that comprise these different teams are working in many disparate systems. Uh, so we live in a world today where uh, for each discipline there are um, you know, domain tools that um, are really strong. So in the testing world, for instance, you've got things like uh, MicroFocus, HPE, ALM, um, that is really a purpose-built tool for testing. Um, but in the land of development and doing um, agile tracking, you've got things like JIRA um, and whatnot. And so just across the board, you've got all of these different tools that are built to help, help each individual kind of practitioner contribute to his part of the process. Um, and so, given that this is the environment that we live in, um, you know, Victor is now going to kind of talk about what that means to us for process and how we think of it. Great. Thank you, Cynthia. So, uh, as you see on the slide, there's a lot of things going on. And even the previous slide, there's a lot of individuals in your organization that are working together to create, whether it's create great software, hardware, or just services for your customers. And so, um, oftentimes, we need to bring some sanity to the chaos. So ultimately that's what process is about. So today we're going to talk about process um, and a lot of times when we talk about process we see all these buzzwords as you see in the word cloud. You see agile, scrum, you see sprint, um, or you might see you know, we still folks using waterfall and, and that's totally okay. Um, so today we're not here to say uh, prescribe and tell you you must use agile, you must use scrum, uh, or waterfall is very important, or even to say that one is better than the other in a particular cir circumstance. And um, every organization is different, and we want to come today and, and just share with you some best practices of, of, of using process and using the right process. So again, back to the point of why we need process in the first place is just to bring sanity um, to, to this chaos. Um, it gives us a collaboration framework, um, a way for people to get together and to collaborate. Ultimately, that, that's a good way to work. We don't want people working against each other. We want um, people working with one another. Uh, uh, individuals have to have um, interfaces, so I mean that might sound very cold and you might be thinking of uh, computer in interfaces or system interfaces, but that's just another way to say when you have humans talking to each other, what, what is the, the cultural expectation, what is the process, what is, um, how, how are you going to communicate, what are you going to um, give and take. Um, process also helps with visibility and efficiency, so if you can show things to one another, um, ultimately um, your process or, or the way you deliver value to your uh, customers or your shareholders will be uh, much more optimized. Um, oftentimes processes unfortunately break down, so it's, it's sad because um, when you start using process for the sake of process, um, then you're, you're pretty much defeating the purpose of having process in the first place. Um, this, might be result, this might result in um, a lot of information silos so that information is not shared across the organization or even across adjacent, adjacent teams. You might be repeating yourself um, a lot of times leading to uh, greater inefficiencies or you might just be um, transmitting um, information that's not updated or, or relevant uh, resulting in a broken telephone. Um, scenario and finally um, just complying with the process if you're not following the process then then again that defeats the purpose because you, you go back to that chaotic environment if you have agreed way of doing um, process within your organization and you're not following it then um, then it's, it's equivalent to not having it in the first place um, 
Stepping back a little bit, um, how, how we understand process, um, it's about connecting people, it's about communication and collaboration. Um, so uh, a programmer back in the 60s by the name of Melvin Conway uh, coined um, this law um, and, and uh, he observed that an organization designs a system which will produce a design uh, which is the, the structure is pretty much a copy of the communication structure. So, so a really tangible example is you know, a typical um, you know, feature or product within your organization might involve, if you're building software at least, um, you, you might want a mobile app for your customers, you might have a website, a front end or a web app, and you might have a back end um, you know, server that has exposing some APIs and, and a data and a data layer, a persistence layer, and so you know, typically that that could be three teams. It could be a mobile team, uh, it could be a web front end team, and it could be a back end team. And those teams are are separate, um, and they're collaborating with each other, and they're they're building a common experience for the customers, uh, i.e., uh, the mobile channel and the web channel. So you can see immediately there's a mapping, right? So if those three teams are doing very well, they're communicating uh, well, they're they're adopting a a process that works for them then that um, process and that structure will be reflected back into the product and the mobile app will, will work very well um, with the back end, the web app will work well with the back end. But say for example your mobile front end team is not talking with your web app team and so you know your, your web team ships a new feature, a new field, uh, but your mobile app doesn't and, and so then they're not communicating then your Customers will see that gap in functionality. They'll see, you know, why, why, why do I have a new field here, and why is it not being updated in my mobile app? And so immediately you can see how this law reflects uh, in that situation. And uh, since Conway uh, back in the 60s, uh, this has been expanded uh, into management theory, and really um, goes to show um, beyond building products uh, and just as you're shipping features uh, and and beyond shipping features. I'm sorry. Um, say you have an organization, you have a marketing team and you have a legal team and maybe you're doing a marketing campaign or your, your a legal organization or legal team is reviewing a certain compliance rules and so forth. If they're not communicating, if they're not following certain processes, things start to break down. Uh, additional uh, to process is collaboration and communication, again, key to process. Um, so. We, we definitely want people to be connected. Ultimately, collaboration uh, is about connectedness, uh, communication, and so this can be helped with uh, asynchronous, uh, what we call asynchronous work style. So, um, you know, you might, many of us still work in organizations where you can, you know, quickly grab somebody and, you know, you can tap them on the shoulder and say, like, I have this really thing that I, I want to check in with you. Can, can we do that? But increasingly so, this is becoming very hard because organizations are getting bigger, so you might need to travel you know, three floors to, to find that person that you want to talk to. Uh, here at GitLab, uh, we can't do that because we're 100% remote, so the folks that I'm talking to are literally across the ocean. I can't tap them on the shoulder. Um, I can Slack them, I can send them a message, but they, they're not guaranteed to respond to me, especially if they're already um, sleeping um, across the world. So asynchronous communication is becoming key, um, and it's, it's become a, a integral part of many processes in many organizations, uh, whether you're working remote or not. Integrated tools, and of course, um, allow for that and also other processes um, that we'll talk about or, or describe some of these best practices will help us with collaboration. So let's just jump in and talk about a couple of uh, key best practices for, for, for uh, cross-functional collaboration. Um, again, I wanted to emphasize that we're, we're not trying to be prescriptive. This is not a webinar that says, you know, uh, follow these steps of Agile and then, you know, you'll ship, you know, software 10 times faster. Um, those are all important. Um, those are all very uh, um, crucial things and, and I recommend uh, people on the line uh, continue iterating and learning about whatever process works in your organization. And we'll get to that actually uh, towards the end of these slides here. But again, we're not here to be uh, prescriptive. We're here to step back and talk a, a little bit about um, you know, higher level abstractions and, and principles um, about uh, cross-functional collaboration and process. So obviously, you know, stepping all the way back, um, what, what is the sake of process? It's, it's eventually, it, it ultimately is to, to serve goals. So if you're, you know, chances are you work in an organization um, and you have certain goals, and you know, ultimately is to deliver a shareholder value. Uh, to create great, you know, services for your customers, um, 
uh, if you're a you know a social nonprofit, maybe it's not it's not a profit motive, but but you know you're still serving users um, and, and what have you. Um, so those goals um, get translated to you know uh, a different time scale. It could be on your uh, your yearly goal is to increase revenue. Um, it's to bring a uh, feature X, Y, and Z to, to your customers. Um, and those goals are, are different throughout your organization. Maybe the, the, uh, the sales team has a goal, um, you know, very clear goals of, of meeting uh, certain targets. Uh, your product team really wants to ship this feature because it will help integrate the product or, or maybe integrate some uh, acquisition that, they just, uh, that you just acquired. So you have different goals, you have different timelines. Um, and uh, depending on your organization, you might use different frameworks. For example, in GitLab, we have uh, OKRs, Objectives and Key Results, a very common platform and framework to, to structure these goals. Um, but ultimately, I, I wanted to mention at the outset, your process event, uh, ultimately serves to, to help you meet these goals. Um, and you can see in the graphic, those goals are, are, are often shifting and it depends on the timelines. So in the, this next slide, you can see that, again, emphasizing different timelines, you have different goals. Uh, a different principle or a second principle with um, you know process and collaboration is establishing a single source of truth again we mentioned earlier there's this um, you know chaos um, with so many things going on um, and you can see in this graphic already that there's a lot of um, activity in inside your organization so a lot of people are doing a lot of different things but once you've established your goal can you write those things down can you establish a ground truth um, you know, ultimately you need some baseline common reality. So I, I've been in a lot of situations where, you know, um, you know, X person, you know, on the product team, and then uh, maybe they're talking with an engineer, and then a marketing person comes along, and then a salesperson comes along, and, and they're, they're, they're just spitballing and, and talking about some crazy ideas, which is good for collaboration. You're ideating, you're maybe whiteboarding, um, but you want to start delivering some, you know, tangible results. You want to, you know, go for those goals that we've established at the outset. So is there some single source of truth? Is there some ground truth? And so that involves, you know, scoping the problem, uh, establishing uh, uh, the constraints of your solution space. Um, you can't, you know, ship everything you want uh, within the next month. So what, what are the constraints? What, what is possible? What, are, what is the capacity, say, for the, for the engineering team? What is the legal um, constraints that the, the legal team has told you or the compliance team has told you? And um, again, back to the point that I mentioned, um, oftentimes I see people talking over each other. They're, they're just saying, oh, I want to solve this problem, but really, I think that doesn't really make sense. Uh, why don't we do this instead? So having that single source of truth, whether it's establishing, uh, scoping the problem space that you want, uh, the problem, uh, um, uh, establishing the guardrails or the constraints of your solution space, and, um, and maybe also, um, saying that what, what are the constraints in terms of, of people or other resources, whether they're, they're people or otherwise. Um, you, know, you, you know that this team, uh, uh, half of the team members are going on vacation or they have to go to a conference. So you need to write these things down. You need to have some baseline common reality um, and that's very important. And uh, related to that is establishing clear visible outcomes or, or measurable um, goals. So we, so we mentioned at the outset, you want those goals and you want a, a, um, a source of truth to, to scope down those goals and, and to approach them the, the, the right way. And so we need visible outcomes. We want a way to have measurable um, ways to, to say that, okay, um, you've uh, increased, um, you know, uh, for, for the sales team, it might be uh, say that, oh, I want to double my uh, revenue in this coming quarter. So that's that's a very obvious metric that you can measure. Um, for a product team uh, delivering a new feature, uh, I want this feature to be delivered in this quarter. I want all these edge cases to be accounted for. I want, you know, uh, the quality up to this par. I don't want, you know, I want my defect rate to be, you know, X percent. Um, these are clear metrics and we want to establish them. Uh, we want clear, visible, measurable outcomes. Um, and so that's very important from a process perspective because, again, um, you can establish all these things. You, you can say, oh, I want you always to email me when this happens. I want you always to um, enter uh, my user story that says, you know, as a product manager, I need to do so and so, so that for this purpose. We, we can set all those rules, but um, ultimately, if they're not serving clear, measurable um, outcomes, it's, it's really useless. 
Um, so, so combining these principles um, or, or saying that um, you have a single source of truth and visible metrics, um, you, you want them to, to be somewhere, documented somewhere. So an example, um, you know, you could be using Google Docs, you could be using a Microsoft Word. Uh, within GitLab, for example, we use um, an issue tracker. So uh, what's illustrative with this issue tracker you see on your screen is that uh, on the right-hand side, you see a sidebar, and there's information there. There are, um, you know, uh, assignees, there are uh, due dates, there is a milestone, uh, there's a weight. So these are, these are structured information. So a lot of times with your single source of truth, uh, you have a framework, and you want to document structured information. Structured information is, is very helpful to, in those processes because it's something that you can define that's clear. You can say, you know, when this piece of structured information changes on, under this circumstance, then you should do this. And you can, um, with that, you can also automate it. So, so that's, that's why structured information is very important. It's, you know, it should be fairly obvious to, to many of the folks on the line that why, why structured information is important. And, and so a tool such as GitLab will provide that. But at the same time, you have unstructured information. So in the center of the page, you have just a title and a description field. And if you click that edit button there, it's, it's pretty much a blank slate. And you can put images there. You can put even GIFs and videos. Um, you can type anything you want um, in any language. Um, and so it's unstructured information because we're creating solutions, we're creating features, we're creating um, services ultimately and, and value for our customers in an unstructured format. And so we need unstructured information as well. And finally, at the bottom, you can see a conversation thread. So the single source of truth, these metrics, they're, they're changing. They're constantly evolving. But we still want that single source of truth to be um, as up to date as possible. But we don't want to say that um, uh, we, we don't want to restrict ourselves and say that it, it must be locked into place. Of course, if you're following, say, a waterfall, uh, process, you might need to, to lock that in place because of certain process. But in the most generic case, there, there shouldn't be a reason to, to lock it into place. Um, so, so, so that's how we, how we see things. And so now the fourth principle is working cross-functionally from start to finish. Um, so what that means is that uh, within your organization, there's a lot of roles. Um, uh, a lot, you, you're hired to to be an engineer, you're hired to be a marketer, you're hired to be uh, review legal documents and, and provide compliance uh, advice or, or to ensure compliance within your organization, or you're hired to, to sell as much as you can. Uh, you're hired to manage a process. So you have roles within your organization. And what's important is that we want those um, different roles to be talking to each other. We want those different functions to be um, communicating with each other as much as possible. Um, and the reason is that that ultimately minimizes risk. So if you're designing a new feature, if you're establishing a new line of business for your customers and you can have maybe your, your business manager, your product manager, they can go into a cave, um, brainstorm, they can go on a retreat and you know, specify all the great new features and functionality, come back two weeks later, they can, they can deliver that spec to the engineering team, they can um, deliver that spec to your legal team, uh, to your support team and so forth and have them review it and then they can give it back to you and you have to update it and so on and so forth. So you can see how there is a lot of wasted time potentially if you don't account for everything um, at the outset as, as, as early as possible. So of course um, you can't have everybody you know talking at once but there is a lot of benefit to having teams working closely together as soon as possible uh, making sure all your bases are covered earlier and ultimately it reduces risk. So, so a really good um, tangible example is when you're creating software and you're creating a feature, you probably want um, you know, a security stakeholder. That, that could be your team, engineering team lead, just accounting for security. Um, but you want you know, security accounted for early on because a lot of times we don't account for security because it's something that's tacked on at the end. So um, if you account for security early on, maybe it's baked or not maybe, it will be baked directly into the design of the, of the software. Uh, it will be accounted for and you can uh, estimate the, the cost uh, or the effort required to, to design something and implement something that counts for security and you don't have to go back. Uh, another benefit of working cross-functionally is just having the diversity of ideas um, beyond the basic requirements. So you have you know, some basic business requirements, um, but if you have a diversity of ideas, um, um, 
you might be, you know, have some soft requirements that you didn't account for and, um, you know, uh, something that's not part of the basic business requirements, but you have some wiggle room in terms of certain ideas. Uh, maybe it's better to do it this way or that way. Maybe it's, you know, it could be something as simple as um, a navigation thing or a certain logo um, if you're creating software. And so having that diversity of ideas ultimately lives, uh, leads to business better outcomes. Um, so depending on your organization, it, it may be very difficult to do cross-functional collaboration. So for us at GitLab, as an example, it's, it's fairly easy because uh, we promote transparency and openness. Uh, we make it really, really easy for cross-functional collaboration to occur because essentially we do our product development and, and essentially everything that we can do in the open we do and even it's shared publicly to, to the rest of the world and the internet to see. Um, and so that means we do everything openly um, anybody and everybody within uh, GitLab can contribute to the idea. So if we have a brand new idea to, you know, add a button to our uh, web app because uh, it will increase conversions in this particular way and it will make the user experience better. Um, everybody can, can contribute to that idea. Everybody can contribute to a design. Anybody can contribute source code to that idea as well. Of course, we have dedicated um, people who are experts in their respective fields and making decisions and it's not a total free fall. I mean, we have process exactly as I mentioned, but at the same time where that process is not overly restrictive to say that, you know, you're a designer, you're not allowed to write code. Um, we don't have that. Or you're, you're a salesperson, you're not allowed to have an opinion on the product. That is definitely not, not how we work at Gillab. But it's, and it's really, really the opposite. Um, so it's, it's really easy for us as an example of Gillab to, to have that. And, um, and the reason is because we, we come from open source roots um, and for, uh, so that everybody can contribute and that has you know, gone beyond source code uh, and contributing code, but just anybody can contribute ideas. Um, and in larger organizations and, and customers that we've seen, they're, they're inner sourcing. Um, and what that means is that they're, they're adopting the open source methodology of everybody can contribute and reusing code, but within a large organization so that that code might not be available publicly to the outside world, but if you have a large organizations with you know, thousands and, and tens of thousands of people uh, and different teams uh, writing code, uh, they might not even know traditionally that they're reusing, that they're rewriting a lot of common functionality. So with inner sourcing, it's promoting the fact that you know, I, I published this library, um, you know, somebody on the other side of the world, uh, you might find it useful, why don't you integrate that library into your work? So, so this concept of open source, inner source, um, you can extend that to, to people and processes um, and, and that's what we want to do and, and encourage as a principle here is to work cross-functionally from start to finish. But practically, can, can that even happen? Maybe you're, you know, you, you, you are very, you're an older organization or maybe you're in a, um, you work in an industry that's highly regulated and it's just not practical for you to be as open. Um, that doesn't mean you can't work cross-functionally. Um, it just means that, you know, um, you might have to carve out different ways to do so. It, it may mean that you have to work with smaller teams, uh, but you can certainly still work cross-functionally. And so that really leads into the final point here, uh, which is how you uh, improve the process. Um, and, and so, so um, you know, I, I've, I've been in some scenarios uh, of a big organization um, and it's, you know, there's a lot of failure in the organization, a lot of the process um, is not working and, you know, the senior leadership says, you know, uh, there, there's a lot of um, bugs in the organization or there's a lot of fat, what can we do? And, you know, they might hire an outside consulting firm, uh, and spend millions of dollars and then they come in, they observe for a month um, and then they say um, with their expensive slide decks and then they say, you know, we really need to, you really need to implement this process that is tried and true. Uh, you need to hire these individuals and you need to comply with this process. So I'm not saying those, those things are wrong. I'm not saying those are um, bad. I'm, uh, what I'm saying is that it's very difficult for those to work. Um, and sometimes you need those radical reorganizations and start fresh. Um, but a lot of times um, what happens is that uh, because you're forcing something uh, on an organization, it's very difficult for those companies to adopt um, ultimately, um, we are all human beings, we're not robots, and if you radically change your organization overnight and, and force everybody to comply uh, with certain process and to use new tools instead of using Microsoft Word, now everybody has to use Google Docs, um, that's, that's very, very difficult. Um, and 
so, so the recommendation here is a more of a grassroots approach. How can you identify the problems? What, what are the small things that you, your team, or, or within your team, or with, uh, with, uh, with an adjacent team, can you identify a small problem? Can you find something that's not working well? And can you improve on it? And, and just try to um, win those small battles, uh, solve those small problems uh, week by week, month to month, and over time, your process will improve, um, and you can show off to the rest of your organization that, that you're improving and have influence over there. Um, and so you can see that uh, within GitLab, we have a retrospective that we do every month, and we have, um, uh, we have uh, small iterations on how we can improve our process. So um, what I wanted to mention is that uh, don't think that just because um, maybe you, you, you don't have a lot of say in your organization. So whether you're a, a people manager, you, you're, you can have a lot of influence, or you're a process manager, definitely have an influence, but maybe you're, you're an individual contributor. So I'm not gonna say you're just an individual, individual contributor. You're an individual contributor, and your sphere of influence is uh, maybe uh, how you present your work. Uh, are, you, are you presenting a status to your direct manager? Are you re uh, providing a weekly report via an email? Um, because that's what's been expected of you or asked of you. Uh, likely, uh, in your organization, maybe you can post that status report on a wiki. Maybe you can send that email to your colleagues, or maybe um, you can have a summary of that information to your manager's manager if they, if, they, uh, if they would like to see it. So there's no reason why you can't iterate on your process even though uh, your sphere of influence is seemingly small. Um, and I would encourage the audience to, to, to think about that, what you can improve. Uh, yourself, uh, what you can grab a couple of colleagues and, and just chat, um, and, and just to start, start small with those iterations, um, and you don't have to radically change your organization overnight. There's there's definitely something small that you can do um, and and influence. So uh, the vision of GitLab is everybody can contribute. It, it's to and and our and our strategy to to do that is is creating an a, a integrated platform. So if you use GitLab, you know that it has provides all the features and functionality to do source code management and essentially to run your business. Um, we realize that's not realistic for many organizations that are not using GitLab or want to use GitLab in a certain way. And so we're, we're working hard to establish those integrations. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to Cynthia now um, because she's gonna tell you something, uh, some awesome tools that, ta that TaskTop is creating to, to do that even in a better way. Okay, so yeah, as um, Victor was saying, you know, GitLab is definitely a purpose-built tool that can accommodate for many of the different disciplines that span the entire software um, development and delivery life cycle. Um, but as he said, you know, oftentimes that piece of software um, is probably gonna be being used in an organization that might already um, be using a lot of other uh, systems throughout their life cycle. And so this image here is just showing, um, you know, an example scenario of what that might look like, whereby you've got business analysts using a tool like JAMA to define requirements, and you've got those software developers using a tool like JIRA to organize their work, um, but a tool like GitLab, is um, GitLab issues to go ahead and um, do some of the source code management, uh, and the testers, you know, have their testing tool over there. And so I think the interesting thing is that whenever you look at this picture, um, you can kind of intrinsically see some of the, the holes or the gaps between these tools and these different artifacts um, that are highlighted in red here. Uh, and this is unfortunate because these um, are really the, the breaks of communication um, that are essential to keep uh, you know, the delivery uh, flowing well. Uh, so again, these are the structural holes that Dr. Ronald Burt speaks of uh, in this quote here. Uh, he's basically explaining that these holes are the gaps that exist within um, organizations between people and groups of people. Uh, our organization has them, I'm sure yours does as well. Um, they represent a lack of communication between people, and he highlights that they're a limiting factor on companies' ability to be agile and responsive to changing conditions. Um, so effectively, whenever you've got a scenario like that, it's really detrimental um, for your customers because Going back to the uh, Conway's law example that Victor talked about earlier, you know, if it if you do have all of these holes and gaps in your, um, you know, life cycle, uh, that's going to be apparent in your end product. And so he did mention that you know there are all of these different methodologies that are meant uh, to kind of help organizations build software better and faster. Um, you know, over the years, new ones just keep getting added. 
Uh, you might be using one of them, you might be employing multiple of them, um, but I think the thing that uh, these methodologies miss out on is no matter which one or ones you might be practicing, uh, the reality is still that you know there's a varied tool set out there. So again, if you look across all of the different disciplines involved in software delivery, um, you can just see that there are so many uh, best of breed tools in each category that are purpose built to help with those various parts. And so given that, you're likely to encounter a situation like this at your um, organization where you have uh, different teams and different disciplines working in the silos. They're all using their tools uh, to contribute their, their part to the, the process, but um, again, you have these kind of glaring disconnects. And this gets even, even kind of scarier and a bit more intense uh, whenever you talk about software at scale. So a lot of the customers that TaskTalk works with um, are you know, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies that really have large scale development shops that have hundreds if not thousands or even tens of thousands of people contributing. So you can just imagine um, you know, how all of these disconnects affected at a scale that big whenever you've got so many people, so many teams working on so many you know, different product lines. And so you clearly, you clearly don't want all of those disconnects. Um, if we go back to that multi-tool scenario um, that involved GitLab issues, what you want is actually a nice and seamless flow of information uh, between those different systems to help the people that are using those systems and building the software um, collaborate more effectively. So this slide is just illustrating that, um, you know, hopefully this is the end result in your goal uh, in your organization where you have a uh, people able to collaborate very easily while still using um, the tool that they prefer to use to contribute to their part um, of building the software. Oh, we got one last defect over there. So basically what I wanna do is um, talk about all of those same best practices for cross-functional collaboration, uh, but to come at it from the perspective of what that looks like and what some of those guidelines are in a multi-tool um, environment. Uh, so the first uh, practice that Victor spoke of was goals first and process second. Um, there's a lot of overlap here between what he said and what I also think is important in that before you go off uh, solving a given problem, you know, you need to realize what challenges you're facing um, and, you know, talk about what you hope to achieve. Uh, and in TaskTop's context, you know, what we are doing is building a communication channel between different people and different teams to allow them to share information. So before you go off and just start configuring an integration, uh, you actually need to sit down and discuss in a cross-team way what information your teams uh, need to share in order to be successful. So uh, as an example that TaskTop actually recently went through, we've got the sales side of the organization that uses Salesforce to track all of their um, leads and prospects and whatnot, and it's really cool because they can actually actually enter in um, product requests that are related to those specific accounts. However, um, the product team who's actually you know, taking all of those requests and doing things like triaging um, and prioritizing and whatnot uses our own uh, system to do that called target process. Uh, and so you can see there's a disconnect between that system. Uh, and the way that we solved it was eventually to set up an integration um, between those two systems to flow those requests back and forth. Um, but we didn't start there. You know, we realized um, there was a problem, but before we just got into the tool and started willy-nilly setting up an integration, you know, we needed to talk through what information our teams needed to share. So we had a lot of conversations with representatives of uh, the different teams just um, to talk about what they needed from the integration. So on the product side, we needed to make sure that enough information was being provided such that we could effectively do the triaging and the prioritization. So we did things like making sure they were recording which customers the request was being driven for. And you know, if it was related to a certain opportunity, what was the potential deal size um, and things along those lines. Uh, and on the other hand, the people on the sales side of the organization needed to, within Salesforce, be able to have the visibility that they needed. You know, they wanted to know, okay, has this request been looked at by the product team? Is it well understood? Is it planned? Um, and all of that kind of stuff. What's potential timeline for it? So only by you know, having these kind of conversations were we able to identify the information that each side needed and then effectively set up an integration that um, fills the needs of both sides. Um, so before I move on, I'll just say that um, you know, discussing the what and the why before the how, I think is the kind of takeaway here for this best practice. 
Uh, so practice number two, establishing a single source of the truth. Um, again, a lot of what I'm going to say is uh, going to echo what Victor said earlier, whereby, um, you know, in, in GitLab, you have um, the issues of various types whereby you're recording all of this kind of structured and unstructured information um, about that artifact. Uh, and so for us, we kind of have the same view in that we see artifacts as the source of the truth. Um, and we really like to think of them as the currency of communication between uh, all of these different people in these different disciplines. So if these are, you know, some of the people that are involved in the actual process, these are some of the artifacts that they're working on throughout the system. And so we like to make sure that everything is recorded on these uh, core artifacts. Um, this can be a bit difficult and it's definitely a cultural thing that, um, you know, you've got to get used to and embed in your teams. Um, because realistically, you know, even though you have all of these systems of record where these artifacts live, you know, oftentimes people don't want to collaborate directly on the issues themselves. As Victor was saying earlier, you know, if you are working in the same office with someone, it's really easy to, you know, grab them, talk to them by the water fountain, get a cup of coffee with them and talk through uh, some of the questions you might have. Uh, and of course, there are all kinds of software applications whose sole purpose is to you know, enable better collaboration by chatting, uh, like Slack, which we use internally. Um, and so what we saw was there's definitely a tendency for people to kind of go offline and talk about things, uh, but then to not um, update the core artifacts with the single source of the truth. So we would make some kind of a decision, but then it wouldn't get recorded. And so, you know, another developer would eventually pick up the story to do the done review and would be slightly confused as to why, you know, a given story was implemented in a given way or why a part of the UI um, looked like it did. And so we've really moved to a culture where we don't want to discourage people from talking offline because we think those kinds of conversations are great. Um, it's what makes working with people really fun is just being able to, to slack them or to you know, have a cup of coffee with them. But we do want to then direct those comments and discussions to the artifacts themselves. Uh, and I was able to pretty easily just find an example from my own work where I had a developer asking you know, about a second AC and saying she was kind of confused about it. And so before we got into all the details there, I said, hey, I think it would be great if we just move this to the issue and you, you know, call out certain people in the tags and hopefully we can come to a conclusion there. And so if you do that, it's pretty cool because then you've got these artifacts that have all of this kind of information on them that people can easily reference. And then from the multi-tool environment perspective, you can go ahead and flow that information back and forth between the systems. Uh, and the neat thing is that is that in, in addition to delivering, um, rather in addition to sharing uh, the fields of the artifacts across the systems, we also allow you to flow different um, other collaboration entities like the comments uh, and the attachments so that those can easily be shipped from one tool to another. Okay, I think uh, this was actually practice four for Victor. I have it as three and reverse the order of it, but that's okay. Um, so the practice uh, is working cross-functionally from start to finish. Uh, I thought this was um, a really cool one and gets back to, you know, what we said at the intro earlier about communication kind of being um, more of a networked thing. Uh, I was actually recently at the Women in Product Conference in San Jose. Uh, I think it was about a month or two now. And um, the VP of Product from Slack, whose name is April Underwood, gave a talk called The Future of Work in Scaling Enterprise Products. Um, and it was really interesting because she showed this visual here um, where she's describing um, communication structures in an organization and how they've changed over time. And so on the left, you can see that in the old days, you had a situation where the communication was kind of very hierarchical. It started up top and then was just kind of distributed down the stream. Um, you compare that to what's on the right and you can see that there's um, a lot of asynchronous communication that again resembles um, more of a networked type environment. And this next slide here I think does a good job of, of demonstrating that both software development and the communication that needs to happen uh, to deliver that software, uh, it's not linear. So this slide here shows that, you know, you can have a lot of requests coming in. Maybe one gets broken out into three different requests. Uh, and those guys can turn into different features that then turn into epics that get broken down into multiple stories. You know, you've got your testing team writing uh, tests against those stories, and making sure they're related to the features. You've got your architecture team that also has got some architectural epics that are broken down into stories. And then, of course, you've got your security team that, you know, maybe finds a defect with one of the stories. And so you can see that whenever you look at, like, the day-to-day -day process of delivering software, 
there's just a lot of activity kind of going on and a lot of chaos that, again, involves a lot of different people. Uh, and so this means that, um, you know, having good communication channels in place um, is super important. Um, one thing that I did want to talk to you is that this slide here is actually showing it um, whereby you actually have different teams based on discipline. But I think another um, good practice for enabling better communication is to actually structure your teams differently so that a single team actually encompasses multiple roles. So here we've taken the security person, the architecture person, the feature person, and the QA person, and instead of kind of siloing them off into different teams based on how we structured things, we put them together on the same team. Um, on the right, what you're seeing is a sort of abstract looking orange box, which in my mind was supposed to represent a feature. Um, and so anytime we do feature development at TaskTop, we like to think about it in terms of vertical slices. So anytime we build a feature, we want to design and scope it such that it's touching all of these different um, components of the application. So you want to make sure that for any feature that's you know, been developed, the architecture has been considered along with the back end and security and testing and the design and the front end uh, and all of those other um, all of those other parts. Um, and the interesting thing is we've actually evolved our organization as we've learned more and more about this um, to structure our teams this way. So in the beginning days of building the integration hub, we actually had a front end team and a back end team. Um, but we very quickly realized that instead of siloing these those teams off, um, it was much easier to just create teams that are also, you know, very um, vertically sliced, as we're showing here. Okay, uh, moving on to the fourth practice about devising clear outcomes and providing visibility. Um, what you're seeing here is a picture of our feature board in JIRA. So we're kind of coming in on the um, sort of design and uh, development part of the entire process. Um, there are, you know, things that happen on the left before it gets here and on the right after the feature has been fully coded. Um, but again, this is focusing on the core development part. Um, you can see up top here that we've got a number of different uh, columns here that represent different states of the artifact. And so for us, uh, in order for an artifact to go from one state to another, we actually have a clear set of outcomes that that feature needs, which initially might sound really heavyweight. Um, but what it does is it makes sure that Whoever is picking up a feature as it's in a given um, phase has all of the information that they need. So for instance, um, if you look at the initial TA phase, a developer can't pick that up to do whatever analysis is needed unless there's a clear product definition uh, that clearly articulates the goals of the, of the feature. And of course, before um, the team can provide a rough swag, they need to have a sense from the initial TA of um, you know, some of the effort involved and. Uh, other considerations like is this a cross team thing? Does it, you know, does it touch both for TaskTop connectors uh, and the core processing engine, and whatnot? And so we've gotten into um, a cultural habit basically of like realizing that each of these things have a clear set of outcomes. And we also, importantly, and this sort of touches back on the single source of the truth, we provide that and write all of that down uh, on the artifact again, so that someone if, picks, if someone picks up the work, they can clearly see you know, all of the relevant information and um, other resources that might exist elsewhere linked from that core artifact. Um, and this is great too, because another thing that you want to prevent in your organization is, um, you know, having one person that knows everything about a given part of your application or about a given feature um, that can then maybe block it if let's say they go on vacation or they unexpectedly get sick and are out for a few days. If you have it whereby they're the ones that truly had all of the knowledge about that, then very quickly, you know, some of these features are going to take longer to get through um, the entire life cycle. But if you're making sure you're cl clearly documenting outcomes and that everyone has visibility, then theoretically this work can just be transferred pretty easily between people. Okay, and on to the, um, the last best practice um, that Victor presented, which was improving the process and iterations. Uh, this is also super important from a multi-tool integration perspective. So what you're seeing here is a picture of uh, TaskTop's integration landscape. So this is actually the internal instance of the TaskTop integration hub that we have running against our you know, production systems. And you can see there are a lot of integrations that are set up. So at this point, TaskTop is a fairly well-connected organization uh, in terms of having all of those communication channels in place to have information flowing between teams. 
But it's important to realize that we definitely did not get there overnight. Um, we built it out incrementally. So what you're seeing on the right side here, um, I think is one of the earlier integrations that we had. Uh, this was very much focused on the kind of developer centric part of the, part of the cycle. Uh, where they're connecting their change, change sets from their uh, source code management system to the artifacts in JIRA. Um, OK, so I actually have a bonus practice that I think is sort of um, applicable to both areas, but especially uh, applicable as you're looking at this topic from the multi-tool environment, which is to keep scale in mind. So, you know, TaskTop effectively wants any organization to, to have a set up like this whereby all the different disciplines are very well connected and, again, have information flowing between all of the different people involved. Um, and whenever you have that, it's very likely that some of those artifacts are kind of being used across the life cycle. So here, if you've got ITSM and Agile and APM and automated testing, there are all kinds of ways that, um, you know, there's a problem effectively in one of these parts. Um, so TaskTap actually uses model-based integration to allow you to define a common model for a given artifact type, and then it lets you effectively map all of the fields um, from the artifacts in these different end systems to that model, so that whenever you want to scale out your organizations to include more projects from the same systems or across systems, uh, you can more easily do that. And I won't get into a ton of detail around it, but if you're interested in uh, learning more, we definitely got ways you can contact us to learn about the specific practice. So in summary, um, we just I wanted to re-articulate what we said at the beginning that, um, you know, instead of thinking about process as um, this kind of negative, heavyweight, unnecessary thing, um, we really like to think about it in terms of connecting people and ensuring that they're communicating and collaborating effectively. Uh, so our high-level takeaway would be to, you know, rather than letting process hinder you, to let it enable you. Um, because for, certainly for what we've done at TaskTop, and I'm sure for what uh, Victor has done at GitLab, it's definitely had positive results and, again, improved those communication channels uh, as we're delivering software for our customers. Uh, we did have a few questions that came in. Our first question is, you mentioned a single source of truth. Um, it's one thing to create a single source of truth, but how do you make it so that all teams adhere to it? Yeah, I can uh, you know talk about this one a little bit from the task top perspective. Um, I will definitely acknowledge that this is a challenge. Um, we saw it you know in our earlier days as well, where like I said, people were getting into the tendency of just having all of these conversations that were side by and forgetting to you know update update issues and things like that. So we've just tried to make it. Um, our development teams actually have a set of core values that they review, I think, on a quarterly basis, uh, especially which is good uh, whenever you have things like new team members coming on. And so usually whenever we have that kind of review of our values and our practices, we make sure to mention things like that. Um, and then after that, it's just kind of diligence for me. So like I said, whenever I've got individual developers or other people that are communicating offline, I'm always reinforcing the fact that it's super important to record that information on the core artifact to make sure that the rest of the team in the loop uh, is in the loop as well. So I think it's just, yeah setting the expectation culturally and then being um, disciplined about reinforcing that. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. Um, I'll, I'll add that um, I totally agree that it's a, it's a culture thing. It's a, I mean, it, that it's, it's almost like an, um, a basic value or atomic. It's, a, it's an axiom if you're doing process. You need to start somewhere. And so if you have a process at all, you need to follow it. So how do you ensure compliance? So, um, you know, some organizations like, like Cynthia mentioned, um, you know, a culture and value, and that that's certainly the case with GitLab as well. Um, and but but I think there's some ways that we can help with that. So, for example, for GitLab, um, it's almost we're forced into uh, adopting that because if we don't follow a single source of truth and we don't have a, a commonplace. So, first of all, we we say that you know our single source of truth is an issue for us, and then from there we say you know are people following that? And, and of course, a lot of people do not follow that. Once people do not follow that, then we then things break down. So we have guardrails, right? We have retrospectives. So if we have a retrospective and we identify that, oh, the reason why you know this feature was delayed or, or there was miscommunication is because people did not follow the single source of truth. So that's that's one place a guardrail to help with um, compliance. I know that sort of a sounds like a, not a good term, but really at the end of the day, it's 
how can we help people adopt that value? And for us at GitLab, it's, it's almost a forcing function because we're remote and we can't just grab somebody and tap them on their shoulder and ask them. Um, they're forced to, to just look at the issue because um, there's nowhere else for them to see. Another guardrail um, or, or a, a thing that will help with single source of truth is just to keep your ideas and, and concepts as simple as possible. So if you have something that's very um, complicated or, or, or extensive, and if you try to describe everything in one, um, you know, one abstraction or inside an issue, then it gets very complicated and it gets very onerous to keep that up to date and people will tend not to keep it up to date um, because if it's so onerous to do so or burdensome to do so. So one strategy is to keep these issues or these ideas very simple. Of course, you're building complex things and you have complex features and processes. And so then can you have a different abstraction level? So, um, you know, uh, in, in Jira, you have issues or in some other tools, you have user stories. Um, but an abstraction above that is, is epics, which GitLab has as well. And beyond that, maybe a roadmap. So, so those are different abstraction levels and those need to be kept up to date as well. So if you have a process whereby you simplify and, and have the right abstraction levels, um, that will encourage or, or help people uh, quote unquote follow the rules and make it easier for them to follow the rules. If you make it very hard for them to follow the rules, of course, um, they will tend to break the rules. Great. Thank you, Victor. And we did get another question and that is, how does GitLab involve non-technical departments um, in the organization such as marketing or business development to the software delivery process? That's a great question. Um, so within GitLab, like I mentioned earlier, um, when we're doing product development, um, well, well, our product is an open source product, so anybody can um, contribute, and it's mainly driven by issues. So every, all the ideas, all the planning is done within our issue tracker, um, and we have dedicated folks. We have product managers, we have team leads, engineering leads that organize those issues so that it's, you know, it's organized so we leverage things like I mentioned like epics, we leverage things like milestones to organize, and we have different views, but we, we leverage the issue tracker entirely. So that means anybody inside the organization and outside the organization can participate. They can jump directly into the issues, they can comment on them, they can um, create new issues, they can update descriptions, um, they can have you know conversations on, on why that's a good idea or a bad idea. Um, so everything happens there. Um, and since it's in that common interface, it's not like, okay, so we're going to update the marketing team at this, you know, weekly, um, week, weekly sync up. So, I mean, we have those to some degree, but it's not like they have to wait for the weekly sync up to give their feedback and then to say, oh, can, can you, you know, let me know when you've updated the issue or updated that feature. Um, they don't have to do that. Everybody can participate directly in the issue. Um, and, and also I wanted to add at GitLab, all the other folks, the other departments, uh, so to speak, they're also using GitLab. So just as the product development team uses GitLab, so when I say product development, I mean designers, engineers, and product managers, they're, they're creating all the features inside GitLab. All the other departments, they're also using GitLab. So they're also using GitLab issues and issue trackers. So we, you know, we, we slightly use Google Documents and spreadsheets, but a lot of the ideas, the marketing team, the sales team, the, uh, the legal team, we're all in inside different, um, we're inside the GitLab issue tracker, but we're using different projects and groups. So there's a, the, you know, there's a, there's a people ops a project within the GitLab instance. And so when we onboard new um, people and we offboard people, it's, it's, a, it's a GitLab issue. And then everybody descends on the GitLab issue and, you know, checks off things and, and comments on them. Um, same for like, you know, chatting with customers. We might, you know, block off certain things to be confidential and so forth. So everything works well within GitLab. Obviously, we, we push for ourselves to use our own product. Um, but by doing that, we everybody can participate in product development, but also the reverse. So if, you know, HR is, or people ops is planning on certain uh, policies and ideas, um, other folks within the organization can participate in that. Same with legal and same with marketing, because we're all using the same tool. Uh, thank you for the question. Great, thank you. And I think we have uh, time for just one more question, and that is, is how long does it take to configure one of these task top, um, integrations on the task top side? Sure, so the, the great thing about it is um, if you've had you know, a few of the conversations that you need to have, uh, our aim is to make sure that you can get a simple integration up and running 
um, you know, as fast as possible. So, you know, I can say I can set up a, you know, functioning demo in five minutes. That's because I'm probably more of an expert in the product. Uh, but for most people, it really shouldn't be um, that big of a burden. Uh, if you actually look at the desktop interface, it's as simple as building up the four key components for a given integration um, and then running it. Uh, it's also easier to get to a working integration faster if you kind of uh, adhere to process number five and kind of improve it in iterations. So we encourage people to always start small and then to scale from there. So we like to encourage people to you know, start by building a very simple integration between your defects. And then once you've confirmed that it's kind of working and information is flowing back and forth, then you can think critically a little bit more about um, other fields that you want to be able to, um, to add. And then once you've got it going between a set of projects um, to connect your different teams, to then scale it up to include more and more projects such that more and more um, of those artifacts are being flown back and forth. So it, it shouldn't be that bad. Well, that concludes our webinar today. Uh, thank you again to our partner, GitLab, for co-presenting with us. And thank you all for attending our webinar.